Good morning. My name is Josh Kennedy. I'm one of the pastors here at Lighthouse Baptist Church. On behalf of the Ernst and the Whitmer's family, Whitmer families, thank you for coming to this homegoing service of Abigail May Ernst, known, bo- known by most as Abby. Our desire for this service today is to remember the colorful and beautifully eclectic life of Abby and to celebrate her memory. This past week, I scrolled through hundreds of posts and comments on social media, many of which were left by you in this room. I've spoken to many that are here today and their reoccurring theme of Abby's life is the joy, the light, and the color that she brought to all that knew her. Abby's life impacted so, so many and the amount of people here today is a testament to Abby's reach. It is good and it is right to feel sorrow and grief as we grapple with the reality of evil and sin and death in this world. Even Christ, as he stood before the tomb of Lazarus, wept as he too recognized the torment and the great grief surrounding death. I would encourage you today, though, that grief in Christ is not a hopeless grief. Despite Abby's dark struggles, there is no doubt that her faith was in her Redeemer, Jesus Christ. And hers is the promise that we find in 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5, that says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an, er- to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, and is kept in heaven for you. Even through her deep sorrows, Abby's hope was Jesus. And her hope is one that is now realized as she is safe in her Savior's arms. A week before Abby's passing, she sent her father, Toby, the lyrics to a hymn written by Isaac Watts. And it's titled, Absent from Flesh, O Blissful Thought. And he asked that I read it this morning as we open our service. Absent from flesh, O blissful thought, what unknown joys this moment brings. Freed from the mischiefs sin has brought, from pains and fears and all that springs. Absent from flesh, illustrious day, surprising scene, triumphant stroke that rends the prison of my clay and I can feel my fetters broke. Absent from flesh, then rise my soul where feet nor wings could never climb. Beyond the heavens where planets roll, measuring the cares and joys of time. I go where God and glory shine. His presence makes eternal day. My all that's mortal I resign, for angels wait and point my way. Let's pray as we begin today. Oh, Father, we come to you this morning with broken hearts. And with the words in the heart of the psalmist, we cry out, how long, O Lord, will we suffer? Lord, you have promised to be near the brokenhearted. You have promised to be our comforter in affliction. You have promised to give us peace. You've promised to be our living hope. And so it is to you that we cling. I pray for Matt and the Ernst family, I pray for Toby and Amy and the Whitmer family, that they would know and that they would feel your presence in a powerful way. May the life and the faith of Abby exalt your glorious name today. It's to the God of all comfort I pray these things. Amen. At this time, Brother Toby Whitmer, Ray Whitmer, is going to come forward and read some words from the Whitmer family and following him. Matt's dad, Keith Ernst, will also share some words from Matthew.
Thank you, Josh. I am Toby's brother and friend, and um, I'm joined by my sisters and my mother, the extended Whitmer family, the extended Ernst family, and the extended Chapman family. And we thank you for being here today, and I thank you for the family that drove many miles to be here. Thank you for being here. I want to just take just a minute and thank Lighthouse Baptist Church, Josh and Tim and Matt and the church board and all the ladies for just reaching out to the family. You have never seen so much food in one refrigerator encounter in all your life. And it, it's overwhelming. And we just thank you very much for that. We thank all of those who have reached out, those who have changed plans to be here. Um, I've been asked literally... <laughs> Sorry. I've been asked dozens, dozens of times, how is Toby doing? How is Amy doing? How, is, how are the girls? How are, how are the boys? Are they okay? And my answer always comes back the same. No, they're not okay. But it's okay not to be okay. We're all hurting. And uh, last I saw Abigail, most recent memory was at Daniel's uh, wedding. Just a few short days, and I've never told either of you this, that Abby reached out to me over some of my own physical struggles, seeing how I was doing. And it's my... Uh, honor to read here the eulogies written from the family and Keith will follow me um, this is from Toby and it's written my dearest Abby Long E Gale your name means her father's joy and you have been a joy in my heart these 28 years you proclaimed yourself my favorite child very early on I have often apologized to you that you were definitely like me in many ways. Your passing did not come as a surprise to mom and me because you were so open with your struggles and we wept and prayed with you through them. I learned somewhere along the way that you process life differently and to just love you and embrace you how you were. You knew my love, my contact, in your phone is dad who loves me i certainly always will i do not know what our close family will do without you as ellie said in the woods that night we are incomplete you had so much love and joy for others though you could not keep much for yourself you pa you loved passionately created passionately lived passionately lived life passionately worshiped passionately, and hurt passionately. In you, I so, so, saw so clearly the conundrum of the truth that Christ dwells with us in our broken, sinful flesh. We truly are saved, are being saved, and will be saved. We long for the freedom with Christ that is now yours by grace alone. I am sorry that you suffered as you did, my love. I could have told you, Abby, this world was never meant for one as beautiful as you. From her mother, Amy. Oh, Abby. Oh, Abby, you kept us on your toes, on our toes, from the very beginning. Many parents start out with easy babies and move on to more demanding ones. You are the demanding one. Oh, he's letting us know you needed something else. But you are my sunshine. You are my light. I was amazed at you from the first day in all of you. As a child, you were full of life and energy. I remember being with you a few times at your workplace at Nemours Hospital. I was so proud of you. I saw how you connected with your coworkers, making each of them feel important to you. You had so many friends and acquaintances. You gave everyone your full attention, 
and loved your friends fiercely. You brought light to everyone you met. It's like you pulled the darkness out of us and filled us with light and happiness. Just sitting in your presence brought me and others joy, and I would crave that time with you if a few days or weeks passed without seeing you. You had a tough life, both physically and mentally. These things were out of your control and not your fault. Thank you for letting us walk through the mountains and valleys with you. Thank you for even taking us down the paths of those dark valleys at times. We never saw the darkest of shadows that you saw. Only you could see those. But thank you for allowing us to try to see them and for allowing us to walk with you. You will be missed, Abby. But oh, how it helps to know that you are finally at peace. No more deep, dark valleys and shadows, just peace and rest with Jesus. I will always love you, my sunshine. From Andrew, Abby was an amazing sister, an incredible friend, and a beautiful person. She was one of my best friends. She was someone I could go to about anything and everything, and she always had some kind of wisdom to give. <clears throat> She had an opinion for everything and love for everyone. It was my privilege to be her brother. I love you, Abby, so, so much. I can't wait to see you again. From Daniel, Abby, it's all over now. Rest now in the arms of our Heavenly Father. You and I were not as close as some of the others were with our other siblings. But out of all of this, you and I were the most similar. Our need for attention and stubborn pride meant that we often butt heads. But at the end of the day, we never held grudges against each other. Instead, I was able to confide in you and you and me about the unique struggles we both faced. But now you're gone, and the burden of causing drama for the family has fallen to me. <laughs> Thank you, Abby. Thank you for being a confidant. Thank you for an encouragement that you gave me to do the right thing. You were always there to give me advice, even when I didn't necessarily ask for it. Thank you for having my back and standing up for me at times when no one else would. I love you so much and will miss you dearly. You are the best third parent my family, any family could ever wish for. Goodbye, Abby. I promise I'll see you when the Lord decides it's my time too. From Ellie to Abby, I miss your words of wisdom and words of utter chaos. I miss your colorful hair. I miss our talks that we had almost every day about life. I miss your smile and your aura of sunshine. I miss you so much. I don't know how to deal with, how to heal from these feelings and I don't know if I ever will. Thank you for giving me 17 years with your presence. I did read these ahead of time. Thank you for all the times you made me smile, gave me good older sisterly advice. I will forever love you and miss you. From Emma to Abby. Abby, there's so many things I wanted to tell you. There's so many things I wanted to do with you. I really wish I could have spent more time with you. I wish I would have gone over to your house more and watched more old movies with you or just talked to sisters. I wish I would have gone shopping with you more or even just hung out with you more. I miss everything about you. Your beautiful hair, your love for Disney, your amazing fa fashion style, and your ability to make a room light up with your presence. Even if I'll have to wait a hundred years to see you again, I will never forget you and your love for everyone around you. I miss you so much. And I want to just say this, and as, as I close, I won't take much time. I, I know there's much to do here. But my wife and I's most recent memory is with Abby at Daniel's wedding on May 27th. And if you were there or if you weren't there, there were dozens 
maybe, or maybe many, I'll just say this. It was an absolutely beautiful reenactment of the Lord of the Rings. And it was just beautiful. And then it was followed by an ultra-fun reception. And at that reception were lots and lots of nerdy Bob Jones kids <laughs> trying to dance on the floor. <laughs> I'm sorry, Daniel, it's true. I won't say that about Hannah's friends, but yours were for sure. <laughs> and I'm, I'm included in that. I never do. I don't know how to dance. But there in the midst of it was Matthew and Abigail who had moves. <laughs> and we sat in awe. And my memories, I'm going to borrow my wife's words, my memories moved to imagination as she was beaming in joy dancing with her husband. We now imagine her dancing in eternity with her pap. We love your family. Keith. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Ray, for being able to share those wonderful thoughts from the family. I don't, I don't know how you did all that, but I hope I can hold up as well as you did. I'm sharing Matthew's words. And I hope I do it justice. Abigail, my true love and soulmate. We met for the first time 10 years ago when I came down to Lighthouse to, to help out with lunch. Macy had introduced us and instantly, and instantly knew we had feelings for each other. But lo and behold, we both had been in relationships at that time. Thankfully, we were because we were just totally different people at that time. As the years passed, we would chat here and there on Twitter, later Facebook and Instagram. Finally, in 2018, we decided to actually start talking seriously and then we started dating. Our first date was right after church with Cameron and Macy. I wanted to be a big shot. I wanted to buy all of our lunches As we were sitting there, we decided that we wanted to go see the movie, The Greatest Showman. Abby and I almost always did not have a lot of impulse controls. So just like that, we found tickets for the show at the theaters and it started in five minutes. <laughs> I bought the tickets and we rushed over to the theaters to get there, just in time for the movie, but we had to sit right up front under the screen, practically. <laughs> but it didn't matter, because I got to be with you. Then came our first official date, and we shut down Cafe Napoli, which is a restaurant on Kirkwood Highway. Well, no one was seated in there, but I, a waitress kept coming back and filling up our waters, so we were lesser to the wise when I looked at my phone and realized, oh my gosh, it's 11 o'clock. It's well past your bedtime. <laughs> then came many other dates and hanging out every night, and I knew very early that I wanted to spend the rest of my life with you. Before I had asked you out, I had called you Abigail, but you looked at me dead in the eye and said, that name is reserved for two people. That would be my father and my boyfriend. Which one are you? <laughs> I had already planned on asking you out, but I obviously needed to do it soon because I would need to use your full name a good amount of times, always out of love. When I asked you out, I had a whole plan, but I 
did have to speed it up because your dad had already thought that I had asked you on Sunday morning and had said congratulations on Monday morning. Uh-oh. <laughs> but I had not asked you on Sunday like he thought. That Wednesday night after the speed skating, we were standing in the parking lot, not the safest of neighborhoods, and I asked you to be my girlfriend. And then for those of you who know this story, I don't, but uh, know that we got asked if we were selling anything in that parking lot. <laughs> I, I, still need, I still need to find out what that is, Matthew, but I have ideas. Then came the time for me to ask your father's blessing. I was so nervous, but knew I needed to do... I know I needed to before you would ever say yes. That's fair. You and your father had a bond so strong, I don't think any other father-daughter duo have or ever will have. We went to breakfast on a Saturday morning, and as we were nearing the end of breakfast, I finally asked him, and your father, in his own quirky way, to sit up and ask the entire restaurant for their help in deciding what to do. <laughs> I wish I'd been there. That would have been pretty fun. Not only did he ask all of them, but he recorded it. And, and I found it this past week as Macy and I were talking, and um, that must have been a joyous occasion. Then came the time for a proposal. So much planning went into it, and it went off great, but I don't think Abby ever knew just how excited I was for it. About a week before, and I had daily pictures with a group of friends and cousins counting down the days till I proposed. I apologize to those people who had to deal with me with the countdown. July 27th was the second best day of my life. Moving forward, when we got married on July 11th, I was really, I was ready for so many years of vacations, adventures, movies, decorating the future houses and so many other things that I thought God had in store for us. My loving wife, I will miss you more than words can say. I will never look at places the same. My days after work will never be the same and trying to pick a movie out will never be the same. I'm going to miss your amazing creativity, spontaneity, spunk, and the love that you showed to make me a better person. Thank you for always supporting me in everything, whether it was school, my job, softball, Anything I wanted to do, you were there for me. Marriage was not always easy, but I am so glad that you were the one that I chose to go through life with. I wouldn't change a thing. As much as it hurts, I am thankful that you are no longer fighting so hard with depression, anxiety, and PTSD. My heart will never be full again. Please keep an eye on me, your family, and our little nieces. We all love and miss you so much. Don't let the bug bugs bite. P.S. I love you more and most. Your tall glass of ginger ale. Thank you. A song that is very special to the family and embodies 
the hope that they are clinging to right now is a song we're about to sing called Christ Our Hope in Life and Death. I invite you all to sing with us. Many of you know it. You're invited to stand. Many of you already are in the back, but you can sit or you can stand, whatever is most comfortable. But would you sing with me the great hope of this song, Christ Our Hope in Life and Death. And you all may be seated. Good morning. My name is Joel. I'm one of the pastors at Redeemer Fellowship, where both Matt and Abby were members, along with Andrew. We loved Abby. 
Abby was a very bright light in our lives and in our church family, and we are grieving deeply with you all. Matt and Toby and Amy and Andrew and the rest of the family, we are sorry for your loss. We are praying for God's sustaining and empowering grace to be over your lives during these days. One of the things I, I really loved and enjoyed about Abby was how uh, she and I were able to relate and laugh over the fact that we were both pastor's kids. Having both grown up in full-time pastor's homes, we were able to joke and laugh in a very good way about the blessings and the challenges of being a PK. One of the things that we laughed about was how pastors always have more to say and how they often try to find an obscure text in Scripture in order to make their gospel point. It's kind of like a, a pastoral flex. Like, look at this verse you've never heard of and the power that I can pull out of it. So, for our gospel reflection this morning and in honor of Abby, I'd like us to consider Exodus 23, 19, you shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. <laughs> not really. I will not speak from that text, but I will also not speak from more traditional verses like 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection chapter, or John 11, where Lazarus is raised from the dead, or even the celebration of the final chapter, Revelation 22. These are excellent chapters and verses for a memorial service like this, but instead of those verses, I do want to speak out of the book of Exodus. And I think that this is very fitting because Abby had a very real hunger for God's word and for expositional preaching, which was instilled in her by her dad. And so I think she would be honored that we preach out of Exodus, which is the book that we are preaching exegetically through at Redeemer Fellowship. Friends, I want us to consider the first three verses of the Song of Moses from Exodus chapter 15. This is immediately after Moses and the Israelites have come through the Red Sea. And it says this, it says, Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. The Lord is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariot and his host he cast into the sea. Amen. Those are God's holy words. This song, Moses' song of deliverance, it, it is a fitting passage to reflect on this morning. And it is a fitting passage because it speaks of the, the absolute triumph and the ultimate victory and power that our God has over all of our enemies, including sin and death. Friends, consider the language of this text. It says that the Lord has triumphed gloriously. I love that that is not weak or uncertain or ambiguous language. No, there is confidence and there is boldness in those words. He has triumphed gloriously. He has cast his enemies into the sea. You get this, this image of our God throwing his enemies, whole horses and chariots into the sea with, with ease. It says that his enemies are sunk in the Red Sea. This is absolute, final, decisive victory. These enemies are not rising up out of the water again. No, they are crushed beneath the power of our God. This language is so strong. Moses and the people of Israel are singing this song because in this moment there is no question about who the one true God is nor about whether he is able to save or not. And friends, it is very good for us to reflect on this verse today because we need to be reminded today of who our God is and his ability to save. Because like the Israelites 
who sang in this moment and then just a few days later would complain and grumble because God brings them into the wilderness like the Israelites. Our confidence in God can be shaken in the wilderness. And we need to remind ourselves of who he is and the great things that he has done. We need to remember how, how absolute and decisive his victory is over our enemies. And no, we, we're not the Israelites necessarily. We, we have not seen Pharaoh drown in the sea. We do not know what it is to be enslaved for 400 years. But my friends, we actually know something even worse. We know the power of sin. We know the sting of death. We know the fallenness and the brokenness of this world. We know what it is to suffer. We know what it is to feel the weight of oppression upon us. Sin and death are cruel and harsh. Loved ones struggle with depression. Darkness seems to overcome them. Horrific circumstances come upon us and we are left in grief. We grieve the loss of wife and daughter and sister and friend. We might not have a Pharaoh ruling over us, but we live in a sin-sick world, and it hurts. And we are very aware this morning of our need for a God who stands victorious over this world. And so even in the face of sorrow and pain, even though we can be like the Israelites and grumble and complain and just struggle in confusion about why God has taken us to this place, brothers and sisters, we must not forget who our God is. He is the one who has triumphed gloriously. He is, according to verse 3, a man of war and he fights for us. And we know that he has fought for us. We know that even more than Pharaoh in the Red Sea, we know that this God has fought for us through the sending of his own son, Jesus, into this world. In God's great love, he saw us in bondage. He saw Abby in bondage. He saw your need for a Savior. He saw Abby's need for a Savior to, to deliver her and us from sin and death. And so he sent his son into this world to redeem and to rescue and to renew. He, he sent his son to become our substitutionary sacrifice. He sent Jesus to be drowned in the waters of his judgment in our place so that we might stand forgiven and recreated by his grace. The same God who fought for Moses and for Israel is the God who came into this world and who said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is what he's done for us. He's fought for us, and he has fought for us through the sacrifice of his son on the cross, and he has brought us peace. And so now, God's word, it is unmistakable, friends. The New Testament writers are like Moses about Pharaoh. They don't use weak or uncertain or ambiguous language. No, they are confident. Paul says, what shall separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord? And his answer is nothing. It is nothing. What has happened to our enemies, sin and death? They have been defeated. And yes, there are moments like today. Moments like the one we are in right now when it feels like sin and death are still alive and well. That our, that our enemies are, are crawling up out of the waters of God's judgment. That they've not been fully drowned. And moments like this are hard. But dear friends, we must not forget who our God is and how he has fought for us. And how he fought for Abby. How because of his power and his his justice and judgment. We have confidence even in the midst of our sorrow. We know that he has had the victory. We know with Paul that though sin and death remain in our lives here today, that the ultimate sting of death has been removed. 1 Corinthians 15, the promise of life to come is certain. Abby might have struggled with darkness, but she did not struggle with her faith in Jesus. 
Abby knew that Jesus had fought for her. Abby knew that Jesus had delivered her. Abby knew that Jesus had triumphed gloriously for her. Abby knew that Jesus was her victorious Savior and that he fought for her. We know that he was victorious. And so, my friends, even in our grief, we can sing the song of Moses We too can sing this song which Revelation 15 says will be sung even in heaven because of how it celebrates God's power to save. Matthew and and Toby and Amy and the family, they can sing today. They are singing. We're, We're seeing them sing through their actions because their grief is deep, but their confidence in God is even deeper. And so can ours be as well. And so let us turn to Jesus and cling to him in faith and in hope. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we do thank you that you are the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all of our affliction. And we pray, dear God, that you would be faithful to comfort us today with the comfort that can only be found in you. Lift our eyes towards you and to the hope that we have in heaven. And Lord, we pray in a particular way, lift Matthew's eyes, lift the Whitmer's eyes, Lord, lift their eyes to see who you are and the great things that you have done, how you have fought for them, and how their hope is secure in you. Pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. your palette blue and gray look out on a summer's day with eyes that know the darkness in my soul shadows on the hill sketch the trees and the daffodil catch the breeze and the winter chills and colors on the snowy linen lake Understand what you tried to say to me and how you suffered for your sanity, how you tried to set them free. They would not listen, they did not know how. Perhaps they'll listen. Starry night, flaming flowers that brightly blaze, swirling clouds in violet haze, reflect in Vincent's eyes of shine up blue, colors changing hue, morning fields of amber grain, weathered faces lined. Soothed beneath the artist's loving hand. Now I understand what you tried to say to me and how you suffered for your sanity and how you tried to set them free. They would not listen, they did not know how. Perhaps they'll listen now, for they could not love you, but still your love was true, and when no hope was left inside, on that starry, starry night, you took your life as lovers often do, but I could have told you This world was never meant for one as beautiful as you. Starry, starry.
starry night Portraits hung in empty halls Frameless heads on nameless walls With eyes that watch the world and can't forget Like the strangers that we've met Ragged men in ragged clothes Silver I crushed and broken on the virgin snow. Now I think I know what you're trying to say to me and how you suffered for your sanity. If you did not know that, that was Toby and um, Abby's song. I get the privilege um, to speak about Abby. Um, so many things that I wanted to say today. I thought of the verse in John fifteen twelve that says, This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. And um, may I say to the family that if you could look around and see what I see now, they are doing what this verse tells us. This is our chance to work out this verse and show this family that we love them as Christ has loved the church if you are a child of God. When I, asked, um, to do, when I was asked to do this, I thought... Of two things. The first thing that I thought of was uh, gratitude. Um, like you, I loved Abby. And the thing about it is, you can love somebody and they not love you back. But I loved Abby and I knew that Abby loved me. I was, uh, I was considered the adopted uncle, and until two days ago, I thought I was the only adopted Uncle Scott, and I found out I'm three <laughs> of adopted Uncle Scott's. I will get over that. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> so when I got home on Sunday, we came last week to be with family, and I got home on Sunday um, as uh, Ray and I drove, I kept thinking, I wonder what the last thing that I said to Abby was. Obviously, it was a text. That's what everyone does today. So I picked up my phone in the quietness of my back porch, and I looked, and um, we had talked about a certain tea, and she sent me a picture of it. She said a few other things, and then I said these words in text, Abby, I love you, and she said, yeah but I love you more. And I thought, daggone it, she always has to get the last word in, doesn't she? <laughs> always. But in her words, that, that meant something. Um, there are so many messages here today. Here's one. 1 Corinthians 13 says that you can have all the spiritual gifts in the world. But if you don't have love, you are loud noise. Right. So we are here today not only celebrating a God who gifts us and honors us and gives us the gospel that we just so beautifully heard, but we are here to celebrate the life of a person who not only understood the life of Jesus and the love of Jesus, but she shared the love of Jesus with us. The other thing that I thought of is what, what do I say? Let's, let's just all be honest here this morning. Um, we have these little trite sayings, as Pastor Ray said, how are you doing? How do you feel? How are, are you okay? And really, there are no words to say, are there? 
mean, if we're honest, there's no words to say. And so I asked God to lead me to something. And he led me to Ecclesiastes 7.2 that says, as many of you would know, it is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. I.e., let me give you a Bandy translation or a Dr. Tim translation that I found out because we were talking about this before and he said, have you read my book? I've already said it, so now I can't take credit for it. But I will say it anyway. It is better to have a funeral than to go to a party. That makes no sense, does it? But it has to be true because it's what God said. Why would it be better to go to a funeral rather than go to a party? I'll tell you why. Because going to a party is a time to have fun. It's a time to let your hair down. It's a time to get crazy. And not to think about things we ought to think about like we're thinking about today. Today is a call for you and me to think about that which is serious. It's a time for us to think about eternity. That there is only true eternity in heaven only through Jesus Christ. Today it's a time of us, for us to think about character and reputation. The call to redeem the time for the days are evil and to remember life. Today is a day, especially to you brother and sister. It is a day to drive us to see Jesus, our only hope in life and death. The only, only way we can make it through a day like today. And I will tell you ahead of time, if you don't know the Christ that Abby knew, the only hope that you have in life is Jesus. So what do we do? Well, we don't say trite phrases. Please don't ask Toby and Amy how they're doing. Don't ask Matt how they're doing anymore. You say, well, what do we do? We put on Jesus. We put on the flesh of Christ. We, as I see him walking to Lazarus' tomb, <laughs> there were no words. He just wept. Today we weep. This week we have wept. And we honor her testimony. And we exalt Jesus. And if you will give me five minutes to finish this, if you were a part of my congregation, you'd say he just lied. <laughs> I just want to say two things. <laughs> Thanks, Ray. You just lost your job. <laughs> Number one. We celebrate Abby's life. It's been said already so many times, Abby was light. And though she fought darkness, she found, she found ways to bring light to the rest of us, didn't she? Someone wrote this in one of the social media posts. It was the one that stood out to me. You may be here today, I don't know. But what apropos words, you were friends with everyone you met. You were fiercely in love with your family. And you lit up every room that you entered. Yet, I hope you do understand that the light that we saw in Abby was not the light that came from her flesh. It was the light of Jesus being worked out in her life. We can't do that. It doesn't happen. When you're going through such darkness, there's no way that you can bring light to other people. It's impossible. But when the light of Christ dwells in you, even though there is darkness, Jesus will prevail. Jesus will shine bright. He will give grace and light and hope. And today we don't sorrow as others sorrow. Why? Because we have the light of Christ. So the light that we saw was the light of the world. We saw a light that calls us to go out into the world and to be light. And so we have to take that up as children of God. Will we do the same? Abby's life was short, but it was not wasted at all. But also Abby struggled with darkness, things that had happened in her past that caused real pain. Her battle 
with anxiety and depression was real. Um, I don't know this for sure, but I think one of, way, one of the ways that Abby dealt with her darkness was to be able to be light to other people. It's just the way that she was able to work that out. If, if, you, if you knew her and you're, you did, that's why you're here, you knew that she loved hurting people, that she showed the light to people that struggled like her. She, actually, she sought those people out. She, she went to people that needed love. This is what I loved about Abby is that she made sure to love those who were left out. She made sure to love those who were hurting. And she made sure to love those who were insignificant to the rest of the world to make sure that they were not insignificant to her. Because that's what light does. If I may, can I give the church a challenge? And I'm not talking about Lighthouse Baptist Church. I'm talking about the church all over the world. We as a church have historically belittled depression. And sometimes we have ignored it. It is real. And we need to have each other's back. That's why Jesus said in John chapter 14 to his disciples, Do not let your hearts be what? Actually, the word means agitated. They were struggling. And it is so interesting that he said those words after one of the most beautiful times in all of Scripture. He just ate a meal with them. He just sat around the table and broke bread with them. And he got up and he washed their feet. But then he told them, one of you will sell me out. One of you will deny me three times. And all of you will abandon me. And you know what Jesus was showing them? He was showing them their darkness. Because we all have it. And if you don't think that Jesus understands that, though there, there was no darkness in Jesus. See, the darkness lies in us. Jesus fights the darkness for us. But let me read a verse to you to let you know today that Jesus understands what that means. Because in chapter 13, the Bible says, after he said these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit. Not that Jesus was depressed or anxious. But Jesus knew that everything that was bad, all the darkness of the world, every battle that every anxious thought and everything that Abby had gone through and that you go through and I go through would, is getting ready to be laid upon the Lamb of glory and He would bear that and He would be abandoned by His Father. And He understood that, as I often say at funerals, Jesus not only came to redeem us, He came to relate to us, to understand us. The gospel calls us to live for Jesus and to look for others who are struggling like Abby did. The last thing that I want to say, and I want to end this the way that my best friend in the world other than my wife, Toby Whitmer, asked me to end it, and that is that we not only celebrate her life, but we celebrate her hope. Abby knew Jesus. Let me say that one more time. Abby knew Jesus. And her decision to leave us had nothing to do with her eternal reality. I would never glamorize what happened last Wednesday. I'm not doing that at all. What I am saying is I believe with every ounce of blood in my body that Abby knew the second she took her last breath she would open her eyes and see the face of Jesus. She knew that. Why? Because she knew Jesus. But that is not the greatest thing that I can tell you this morning. The greatest thing is that Jesus knew Abby. It's not that we know Him. 
It's that He knows us. That He loves us. He cares about us. And so our hope today is that Jesus Christ takes all of this for us because He loves us. And don't think for a second that Abby was alone last Wednesday. See, not only does Jesus love you, not only did Jesus die for you, but Jesus keeps his promises. I go away to prepare a place for you. If I go away to prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will bring you to myself to where I am. You may be also. That will happen because Jesus keeps his promises, doesn't he? How, let's go through the whole, we could go through the whole scripture. Jesus keeps his promises. I'm going to give you a promise right now we're going to end with. Jesus said to his children, I will never leave you. Never. And in that park, last Wednesday, Abby was not alone. Jesus was with her. And Jesus took her home. It's the hope we have. It's the only hope we have. Because that hope is in Christ. He is the way, the road to, the he to heaven, to the Lord. He is the truth and He is life. He gives life. He, he sustains life and He takes life. That's what He does. So we weep and mourn. But we rejoice that Abby is with Abba. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. Let's pray. Papa. Abba. You are so good, and you are faithful and kind. Your mercies are new every morning, and great is your faithfulness, but it doesn't feel like it sometimes. Lord, we're, it feels raw. Life feels raw, and it hurts. And we mourn with this family. We have no words except Jesus is good no matter what the circumstances are. So, Lord, would you please tell Abby that we love her? And would you tell her that thank you for loving us, that she loved us, and she showed us what Jesus looked like in many ways and that we will see her maybe soon. Jesus, even so, come Lord Jesus today. Father, help us, help, help us to mourn with his family. God, help us to continue to weep with them, putting on the flesh of Jesus and being Christ to them. And Lord, I pray for Matt and for Toby and Amy and the kids. Jesus, would you allow Holy Spirit to give them what no one else can give them, the great comfort that can only come from God himself. And we promise you, Lord, whether at a funeral or at a party, we will give you the glory. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Matt, if you'd come. Forward, please. Ladies and gentlemen, final, this final prayers that does conclude the services here at the church. We will be going in procession to Hickory Grove Cemetery. Everyone's welcome to join us. We ask you to please turn on your headlights and your flashers. We will be blocking all intersections to get there. Those gentlemen who will be serving as pallbearers, you can come forward at this time. 
Also, we'd like to make a little announcement. Due to the volume of the cars in the parking lot, we ask everyone who is not going to the cemetery to remain here until the procession has left the cemetery, or left the church, just because cars are going every which way. We want everything to go smooth. We will be coming down the middle aisle with the casket. Everyone, please remain where you are until the casket has left the church. Those folks in the back, if you can just exit as we come up with the casket. So this time, I'd like to have the pallbearers come forward and the pastors are actually going to lead us right down the middle aisle. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> 